I am poet and translator Peter Cole, and that's a bird in my backyard garden in New Haven's Worcester Square, where I'm speaking to you from. Uh, I've been down here uh, as often as possible during the period of quarantine, uh, but I'm down here now, especially today, because the project I've been working on during the entire lockdown period has a garden at its heart. The project began about a year ago when the composer Aaron J. Kernis wrote to me and asked if I'd be interested in working with him on making a, a new piece of music, the one he'd been commissioned to write for Yale's uh, Schola Cantorum Choir and for Juilliard's 415 Baroque Orchestra. Uh, I like the idea. I'd never written uh, a libretto before, uh, but I like being led beyond myself, and I also listen to a lot of new music, and I'm especially interested uh, in music that involves words. So Aaron and I met for lunch to talk about it, and um, fairly naturally, we've known each other for a long, long time, uh, we came to the decision that this piece should take shape around the idea of the garden broadly construed, um, but within the context of the three Abrahamic faiths. So I let that idea sink in. I began reading pretty widely, uh, things from uh, climate change to Kabbalah, uh, depth psychology and apocalypse, or maybe that should be uh, depth ecology. Uh, I read about Islamic gardens and Renaissance gardens, 16th and 17th century English reworkings of the Song of Songs. Uh, all that and more began filling up uh, notebooks and um, eventually a through line emerged uh, with Eden at the center, but not Eden as the story of the um, serpent and original sin, so much as Eden as a place of first response and responsibility. Uh, something maybe along the lines of what Emily Dickinson had in mind when she said uh, that Eden is always eligible. By the time Corona hit in New Haven, mid-March, uh, I had an opening movement uh, worked out for four voices, and I had worked through that uh, with a lot of, with Aaron, through a lot of back and forths. Um, we had ideas about where the piece might go, but uh, nothing in particular. Um, so in many ways, the piece actually did evolve with the uh, lockdown situation. Um, and as that situation began to deteriorate uh, economically, socially, medically, um, as the lockdown intensified. One of the things that really jumped out at me and impressed itself on me was the way in which this extreme situation was exposing something fundamental about our being, but something that was normally hidden by our day-to-day -day lives and um, their busyness and business. Uh, and that is the amazing and uh, even miraculous and truly frightening interdependence uh, of all things uh, for better and worse. So for example, a bat in a Wuhan market breathes or apparently shits and a friend dies in New Jersey. Um, Airports empty out, toilet paper flies off the shelves, uh, entire systems of higher education and international economies are threatened with collapse, and particular lives and livelihoods do, in fact, uh, collapse. Um, George Floyd's horrific murder uh, further extends and complicates the ways in which an extreme situation uh, can expose uh, the occluded normal. So that's the situation Aaron and I found ourselves in. Um, Hyperconnectivity or connectivity run amok was causing the world to come apart at the seams. Uh, and here we were collaborating on a piece that was in many ways about a kind of cosmic uh, collaboration or a lack thereof um, for a super spreading choir and a tight knit, tight -knit uh, heavy breathing and traveling orchestra. Uh, so I did ask myself more than a few times, it even, uh, might not be beside the point here. Um, and yet the situation was also, and this was becoming increasingly clear, the situation was also like the Eden situation, bringing us back to basics in a very uh, sharp and focused sense of what matters. Uh, for example, breath, the ability to breathe. 
what happens when that's taken away. Companionship, health and sustenance, the small, major, minor pleasures of all of those things. And in a larger sense, what our role might be or needs to be in relation to just about everything and everyone both around us and in a sense in us. So in other words, I really was um, writing into that Dickinsonian sense of the eligibility of Eden, uh, but also the responsibility uh, of it um, to tend and attend to it as we might understand one of the key verses uh, in Genesis 2. And as I worked, I was fortunate to have, um, among other things, Worcester Square and its paths. Uh, I was also lucky to have Zoom and to be able to uh, meet virtually with Aaron and um, with the members of the Juilliard faculty uh, who were talking uh, to us about what their instruments can and can't do, like to do, don't like to do. Uh, they were talking from their kitchens and their bedrooms and their studies, so there was a kind of intimacy that I don't think we would have normally uh, had. Uh, and, but I was especially moved by the way they spoke about the pleasure they take in making music that lifts up words and carries them uh, to listeners. Um, so I hope you get to hear the finished oratorio someday. Um, I hope anybody gets to hear it someday. Uh, but for now, we'll make do with a, uh, a short piece uh, from the libretto, which we're calling Eden Songs. Wanting song in the beginning, beginning to end. Now we are falling through what's to come. Needing Eden, now we are drifting. Eden undone, as if from the ends of earth hearing Eden's calling to tend and attend, now we are sprawling through what we've done, through what we're losing, as what we've won, as we are falling, as Eden is calling earth and heaven, wanting song. <laughs>